Welcome to, uh, to the Fig Tree, to the, the very first special event that the Fig Tree has hosted um, uh, in, in the Fig Tree, the world's first international fair trade visitor centre in the world's first fair trade town. I can't tell you how good that makes me feel. Like. We've got some very special guests with us, of course, today. We've got um, uh, Adiod and Amantin and Foxit, um, our friends from the Roman Coffee. Yeah, happy yeah. We have Damien from Bonning Coffee. Uh, and, and all these people have given up their time um, to, to come to the event to support the victory. First of all, uh, I would like to say uh, thank you for uh, everybody who just came on these uh, beautiful uh, days. Uh, you know, for the existence of OCC, there were two reasons. Uh, the first reason was, you know, we came from Ethiopia as a refugee in 2007 and 8. We were to around 215 uh, community uh, came to in this country. So the problem was when we came in this country, as you know, when you're traveling even for a holiday, you can imagine what is the difficulty, the language problem, the culture problem, and the lack of integration, and so many problems. Then after that, uh, our choice was just depend on the benefits. We just go to the job center and receiving you know, to, uh, uh, the money, which is not helping us, and as well as helping uh, uh, others. Then uh, after that, what was happened? Uh, you know, as you know, we are a young uh, people. So if we as young people depend on the benefits. Who can just help the world? Who can just help uh, others? And who can just you know feeding us? That was uh, one problem. Then after that, what we did, we just explained our problem into the uh, local community. You know the problem what we had, how to try to you know improve ourselves, how to try to you know integrate into this community. Then after that, uh, we joined with uh, uh, a church group which is called uh, In Stampus. Uh, uh, Stella Bridge uh, is already there. So I would like to say thanks by using this, uh, this opportunity. Then after that, we discuss with him our problems, and uh, then after that, we decide to create a uh, Oromo Coffee Company. Then Ian, after that, mm, contacted us with Lorang Foundation, here Ian from Lorang Foundation, and then after that, we made a meeting and explained to him uh, uh, that is uh, how OCC was uh, existed. The other problem, uh, when I came in this country, uh, one day my friend just visited, uh, invited me at Manchester uh, coffee shops. Then what was happened, one cup of coffee in coffee shop is two pounds. But before I came in this country in 2004, what was happened in farmer in Ethiopia, one kilogram of coffee, it was about 20p. That means if you calculate one kilogram of coffee is about uh, 18 cups of this, which is around 200 pounds. So the question is, if you as a community paying 200 pounds and uh, the, farm, the farmer is receiving only 20p, where is that money is gone? That was our question. So that is not my question. It is uh, the community question. If you as a community paying 200 pounds and uh, the farmer is receiving only 20p, where is the fairness here? So in order to avoid or in order to uh, uh, eliminate this problem, uh, we brought the idea which is called community to community trading. That means cut out those people who are exploiting the two community and then directly bring the coffee from the farmer, pay for them a fair price and also invested here. We, we as a young generation, we don't have you know, jobs and we try to create a job. Uh, that is the idea behind of uh, OCC. So that's all I can say. Uh, thank you very much. Ceremony. All right. So this one is, as you can see, what we call the Oromo coffee ceremony. So as you know, uh, Oromia region of Ethiopia is the birthplace of coffee, which is in fifth century. So this is a traditional way of making coffee in our society. This is, uh, I mean, that when you looking this is look is, uh, is traditional or culturally, it 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 has you know a big advantage, especially in Oromo society. Uh, three times each day. The first one is in the morning before going to jobs. Everybody is, you know, making this coffee ceremony, sit together, uh, the family come together, discuss their problem, then they plan what they are going to do on the daytime. 
Then after that, during lunch time as well, when everybody tired and came from uh, jobs, the coffee ceremony again ready. Then after that, they discuss what problem faced in uh, environment of jobs. And then after that, finally, at uh, uh, evening time. The evening time is mostly uh, is, is help the children. When the children is integrated with the family and you know the family is you know uh, teaching the children about their history, about their problem, good culture, uh, good behavior, and so on. So this is what's called the uh, Oromo coffee ceremony. Um, the company I work for have been roasting coffee now for around about 30 years uh, and initially started by a gentleman named Clive uh, Barnforth who sadly passed away in last, uh, last week but uh, at the moment the, um, his son uh, is running the company and I've been lucky enough to, to work for them for, uh, for nearly 10 years now and uh, it's been a real journey and an experience and um, an eye-opening uh, um, world for, for me really because before that I never really understood too much about coffee. Uh, you know, apart from the, the basic elements of, uh, of drinking it, like, and it's only when you start to, to, to delve a little bit further into not just coffee as a, as a product itself and as a drink and the, find out more about the culture and the heritage behind it, but also understanding the, the industry overall and working back, uh, beginning to see how much, um, how much sheer effort and passion and things go right back along this sometimes far too long chain back to the producers and the farmers. And um, now I've been very lucky to, to get chance to, to travel to Origin and to see a lot of these places. And it's really had a big impact on me and um, my appreciation of the, uh, of the wonder that is, uh, is coffee today. I mean, it's, it really is a drink that I guess so many people around the world enjoy, but it, it started, started really in, in Ethiopia, of course, and um, with the, the Aroma people and um, I think even as we've been to see the, the coffee ceremony, I've, uh, again, I've been lucky enough to, to share coffee with, with the Abbeyot and uh, his family and the things with before. And um, you really understand that coffee is something more than just, just a drink. It is, it is a cultural, it's, a, it's such a strong aspect of people's lives. And I um, mean, you always talk about Abbeyot, about how it, um, you know, people brings people together to solve, solve problems and to sit under the tree and the like. And um, no, it's, it's a living, um, a living material and uh, there's a lot of story behind each and every cup so so really we'd have to um, travel back in time to the uh, to the initial discovery of coffee in in Ethiopia and uh, where would be the the, the area that that where it would first have been discovered Jimma yeah so and um, uh, you know the Roma people have been enjoying this coffee and the magic w that happens when the uh, the coffee beans end up in the uh, in the fire and uh, enjoying the drink for many centuries before I guess the the word spread and really in coffee there, there are what we call two main types of coffee I don't know whether people know what the two main types are but uh, we have Arabica coffee and we have Robusta coffee which is going to start off my first passing round it's going to take a long time to pass around the room but we're going to start with this these are unroasted Robusta coffee beans um, now these the heritage of these is not in Ethiopia but I'm just going to pass them around and one thing you'll notice about raw unroasted coffee beans they're very very neutral if you actually have a smell there's very little very little there which shows that although a lot of the um, the hard work has gone into producing that product there um, it's actually only the roasting itself that starts to bring coffee beans to life um, so if we imagine you've got natural sugars aromatic oils living in those beans there and um, it's the heat and the chemical reactions that take place that actually start to bring that all those um, aromatics to life and um, you know coffee is probably one of the most complex um, drinks you can get in the world possibly just after after wine so all that sweetness we're trying to in the roasting process caramelize the sugars make all these fantastic reactions happen and when you when you grind the beans I think everybody knows you just get that real blast and smell of something uh, wonderful and, and, and fantastic now Robusta coffee is probably takes up about 40% of world production um, Primarily grown in um, some in Brazil, um, in East Africa we'd find it in Uganda, Tanzania, places like that. Um, India grows a lot of robusta, and also Indonesia. And um, actually, the biggest producer of uh, robusta in the world is is Vietnam, which isn't typically associated with with coffee. But robusta is generally deemed to be the the slightly more inferior type of coffee. It it grows at lower altitudes, so 
between sea level and about 1,000 metres maximum. Um, it's a much hardier plant, it's why it's called Robusta, which is a benefit to a lot of farmers who grow it because they can grow higher yields of crop. It's less susceptible to disease and pests and the like. Um, but the honest answer, it doesn't taste quite, um, it doesn't taste fantastic. It tends to get used in blends, um, a lot in instant coffee and the like. And but that doesn't mean to say that it doesn't play in a very, very important role in um, a lot of people's lives. And um, so you'd even quite frequently find nowadays um, Fairtrade certified um, Robusta coffee, where again, it's just the focusing on the principle of paying that higher um, value to back to the producer and the farmer. However, Robusta will always find in the marketplace a price that is lower than the second type of coffee, which is uh, Arabica. And I'm gonna pass some of this Arabica coffee around now, and you, you'll automatically see when finally you come around the room, there's a slightly different shape and style to the, to the beans. Um, but Arabica typically, that's the, those are the beans that, were, that you can trace. Every single Arabica around the world, you can trace back to, back to Ethiopia, to those first few wild trees. And Arabica typically grows at higher altitudes, so between 1,000 and 2,000 meters, which is some, you know, some serious height. And Actually, the altitude really helps in slowing down the, um, the maturation of the, of the fruit. So the coffee beans themselves grow within a, um, a cherry. Uh, there aren't any... Just glancing to see if there's any pictures around that, but no, uh, not the moment, but... Uh, oh, we're... But, yeah, so we'd understand from, uh, from just on, on there. Um, sorry. Ah. Oh, Fantastic poster. So, <laughs> beautiful ripe red cherries are what we're uh, what the farmers looking for. So, you're picking these these cherries here. You get two beans in every um, in every uh, in every coffee cherry, um, and then they need to be processed, ready for uh, um, to be dried and used. But uh, now the best coffee are the ones that you do allow it. It's like any fruit. Uh, if you start picking the the green or the unripe, you don't get the the full fantastic flavors in there. But what happens when you, these, these trees are growing at higher altitude, it actually slows down the growing um, with the, uh, because there's less oxygen at the higher levels. So it actually slows down the development of the sugars and the like. So we tend to find the best coffee grows at the really high altitudes. And it's no surprise to find that um, in Ethiopia, I mean, the coffee's growing at some, some very serious um, heights there. And the flavors in a lot of Ethiopian coffees are absolutely, uh, absolutely fantastic. Um, so Arabica is actually a much less hardy plant, it's a lot more temperamental, um, produces lower yields, so it does a lot of, mean a lot more care and attention. Uh, and it's actually got less caffeine in than Robusta as well. So caffeine's got, um, sorry, Robusta's got twice as much caffeine in it as Arabica coffee. So if you ever have a cup of coffee and think, do you know, I, don't, I really don't fancy another one because I'm, you know, it's hit me already, it's uh, probably because it's got quite high Robusta content. And that's purely because um, caffeine is actually a uh, natural insecticide. So you find it at the lower altitudes where Robusta grows, um, the, the insects are thinking, ooh, fantastic coffee cherries over there to go and uh, eat and attack. And the coffee tree is saying, uh, you, you have no chance of this. We're putting some more caffeine in there. So, uh, um, so that's just really the reason why uh, caffeine naturally occurs uh, in coffee. Um, so, uh, so if we think, uh, moving on from Ethiopia, um, all those fantastic wild Arabica trees. Um, when, when people start to see the, the, the potential and the magic in there as well, um, I think on a commercial scale, it, the coffee trees would have been then um, been started to cultivate in, in the Yemen. And um, it was from there that really along the old traditional trade routes that coffee seeds were starting to be moved out to a lot of, I guess, colonial um, type areas. So with a place like Britain would have transported coffee cherry to places like Jamaica. Um, Spain would have moved a lot of coffee over to uh, Latin America and like, and the Portuguese to places like Brazil and so on, uh, and the Dutch to uh, the East Indies and what's become Indonesia and Java. So we've really seen how coffee really has spread around the world and become an absolutely vital uh, cash crop to so many people out there. Not just the people who are actually producing and growing coffee, but actually um, a lot of people work in the coffee industry in terms of being hired by farmers to, to actually harvest and pick coffee cherries. So there are, there are lots and lots of families um, working down that chain who rely on, on coffee overall. Um, so we can see already, and what I'm going to do now is I'm going to pass around, um, first of all, um, another little tray here, but it uh, doesn't look particularly attractive, but that is um, dried 
coffee cherry. Now, I think um, we've got some in the whole bean, the whole form just here, if anybody wants to come and have a look at the end. But um, what would you call it when you, um, if you can actually make tea from those, the, the, the ground coffee cherry? Um, it makes a really nice, sweet um, fruit infusion. Um, and we'll actually, I'll pop some water into some of these and perhaps people can have a, come and have a little smell and uh, possibly a taste uh, in a short while. But it's amazing to think that actually the, the, the coffee cherry itself uh, starts to influence the, um, the taste of the coffee. And this is when we get onto the idea of how we, we process and create flavours in the coffee beans. So it's not just, for instance, the, the, the species itself. So Arabica has a different flavour to Robusta. But then we can actually start to find down that a lot of what we call heritage varietals, it's a bit like with wine and with grapes, the idea of Cabernet Sauvignon or Sauvignon Blanc and Chardonnay, all these different grape types. You can actually find in Arabica lots and lots of different um, types of Arabica varietal. And each one has its own characteristic and flavour. And it's very interesting to really find out how those varietals actually influence on the taste. So on one hand, it's the, the coffee bean itself that's creating some of the flavours. On the other, it's the terrain and the altitude and the, the weather conditions. That has a big impact. And then the third big impact back at origin is, is the, uh, the techniques of the, the farmer or the producer himself. So there are two real ways that we can take this coffee cherry and really process it. It's ready to be shipped to be uh, roasted by people like ourselves. Um, the first one's called the, uh, the natural method. So the beans, the coffee beans, are actually going to be dried within the cherry itself. So we actually hand pick the, the cherries from the tree and lay them out either on terraces or patios or even what we might call raised, raised beds so that you get allowing the air to circulate. And um, really that's, uh, that process is, is going to take a good two weeks or so to actually get the coffee cherries dry and the beans within it to dry as well. You imagine you want the best quality and like any natural product it will deteriorate if it, uh, it's allowed to uh, uh, to ferment to too much extent. So, um, I'm going to do first of all, pass, I'll pass a couple of these round. Now, these, have a, these are the same, those two there. Yeah. Yep. So, these are Ethiopian um, Hara coffee, and um, that is what we call a naturally processed coffee. And mm -hmm. what you find is that the, the cherry itself is started to influence on the coffee beans. So, you get a really sort of sweet, slightly fruity smell to it. Um, Sometimes people describe it as blueberries, strawberries, um, but it's quite noticeably different from, from a number of what you might call typical coffee and, or coffee smells. Um, so the other main processing method is to um, wet process the coffee. Now, first of all, you're going to require lots of water resource. So some farmers might not necessarily have access to to large volumes of fresh water supply, um, which is why typically some areas you would, you would associate with the dry processing methods. But for better quality, typically, um, farmers use wet processing. So they actually pulp the cherry um, when it's freshly picked from the tree. So you're splitting away the, the fruit from the bean. Now, you'll still find that some sticky fruit living, you know, still stick, stuck to that bean. And um, in order to dry the coffee successfully without it deteriorating, um, you then actually put it into, into water and fermentation tanks. So the bacteria will work for about 24 hours, break down that last of the sticky substance. You can then actually put the coffee back into very, very clean, fresh mountain water, give it a good scrub, you know, really agitate it, get rid of that last bit of fruit, and then you'll find that you're able to dry the coffee in a lot shorter period of time. So there's less chance for any deterioration of, uh, to actually happen. So typically what we call wash coffees tend to attract higher premiums and, and have generally been seen over the years to be higher quality. Now, in Ethiopia, again, um, both methods are used um, depending primarily on, on the region. So in Harar, we get the dry method. Um, in Yergeshefi and um, uh, is typically in Sadamo, are good examples of washed Ethiopian coffees. So with those, um, I'm just going to hand around this coffee right now, just as a, as a contrast. Um, really washed coffees are still quite sweet smelling, but you usually get less, um, less of that kind of typical fruity red berry smell to it. So you get some really nice caramels usually, and uh, toffee smells, vanilla and things like that. 
Um, but it's, it's amazing to think that those two processing methods do create really contrasting flavors. Mm. So all over Ethiopia, it really, it's, I think it's fair to say that the, it is the terrain and the, and the conditions and the resources um, that do heavily influence the way in which the farmer approaches processing that coffee. And ultimately, you know, the, the actual taste um, when people like ourselves come to, uh, to, come to roast it. So uh, that really is quite uh, influential, I guess. Um, so that hopefully gives you an, an indication of um, the, the two main ways of actually processing coffee back, back at origin. And we actually have the two that you're smelling right now. The two coffees are in here. And I'm not sure what the best method will be to, to hand out little samples. I don't know whether it's perhaps in a short period of time. Um, but we do have some little sampling cups. And I think it'd be nice for everybody to just have a tiny little taste of, of each one, just to kind of... You've, Smell is one thing, but taste is, is another altogether. So we're using all our senses to really get a, a good indication. But um, yeah, absolutely, if, if that's possible. Um, but really, yeah, so the idea would be just, just perhaps splash a tiny little, just a tiny little drop in there so people can have a, um, so. Are these both the same? No, this, this one's one. So that's the, that's the Ethiopia, the natural. And then the wash coffees on the other side. So, like Hara. Like yeah. In the churn. Yeah. 